Robin. What brings Milken Institutes to Hong Kong for this inaugural event? I mean, how did this come about? What was really the conversation? Was it the Hong Kong government really needing to attract business travelers, a talent and capital? Is that what it was? Well, thank you, Sherry, for having me this morning. Well, as you know, the Milken Institute Global Conference in Los Angeles and its Asia Summit in Singapore have become a common event uh, for the investment community globally. And, uh, and we feel that, uh, as you know, that China being the second largest economy in the world with a GDP of 18 trillion U.S. dollars, and which is more than 50 percent of the combined GDP of the entire Asia Pacific. So that being the case, Milken Institute, we feel that we just cannot afford to be absent from doing our part to forge constructive engagement and conversation between global investors and Chinese entrepreneurs and Chinese consumers. And where else to do that but Hong Kong? And speaking of global investors, um, just over the weekend, the Hong Kong government's national security law took effect. For global investors as well as businesses looking at Hong Kong, is this a, yet another um, reminder to reassess their presence here in Hong Kong? Well, as you know that uh, China is facing its probably most challenging uh, economic challenges of wars in about 40 years. Right? It's a combination of systemic, cyclical and geopolitical risks that's coming together at the same time, which make it very difficult. So investor sentiment are not, uh, shall we say, uh, very positive, is a little bit wary, if understandably so. And that is because the old China narrative that have served them so well for so long are no longer valid, and they need a new China narrative. And this is exactly what the symposium here in Hong Kong is about. We want to give people uh, the ingredients, uh, the confidence, and the ideas so they can go away and start developing their own version, their bespoke version of China narratives for themselves. Yeah, and of course, when Chinese government as well as Hong Kong government come out with these national security laws, it's really about stability. But for global investors and businesses, people say it's really the broad nature, the vagueness. What do you say? I think over the fullness of time, stability and predictability uh, will show themselves to be necessary ingredients for success. And uh, so while we may be uh, perturbed by that for the time being, but the reality is that over the fullness of time, I believe this will turn out to be stabilizing factors for longer term investments. And let's talk about Tomasek very bullish or it's very heavily invested in China. The top holdings coming from Singapore, the second is in China, 22 percent. Are you making any tweaks perhaps up or down down the road? How bullish are you feeling about China? Well, I think I can't be speaking on behalf of Tomasek anymore since I retired from Tomasek end of last year. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that being the second largest economy in the world, and China has many things going for it. China has uh, capital, has talent, has research institutes, has market, has a pipeline of strong entrepreneurs, and all that augurs very well for China's future. And I think, uh, and, and not, not forgetting, a very industrious, hardworking workforce at the same time. And uh, so I think however your allocation of China's exposure to be, uh, make all the necessary adjustments as all risks uh, conscious uh, investors ought to be. Uh, but I think stay focused and stay invested. And with this year being just really the year of elections worldwide, and obviously the U.S. election is closely watched, I think it's safe to say that it will create more economic pain for China, no matter who wins. Um, we're talking about a race between a guy who started the trade war with China and then a guy who sort of broadened the war with China or the economic um, and, of course, the trade war with China. How should global investors be positioned around this? I mean, is there any winner? Is it in Southeast Asia or countries like Mexico? Well, I think uh, I'm not an economist, but if you, as a layperson, if you look at the, the numbers, I think it's fair to say that China's trade is still very robust. So while the China export to U.S. have declined, uh, China export to ASEAN, India and Mexico have increased very significantly. And I think that's a sign that tells us that the global trade 
while fragmentation has taken place, but China export remains fairly resilient. I do want to end on AI. Um, I feel like now it's time for investors to approach this topic in a more nuanced uh, manner. Um, really look beyond NVIDIA, look beyond OpenAI. What are you hearing from your sources or people around you, global investors? What is really the next phase of investing in AI? I think it is AI. It is also more than AI, right? I mean, in the case of AI, I would imagine just like internet, it will permeate into the entire spectrum of industries and companies. So companies will not just be internet enabled, but companies will also need to be AI enabled. And I think the opportunities in the secondary derivatives market of all the across sectors in companies will represent tremendous investment opportunity for us all. But uh, it's also more than AI. I think China's uh, huge investment in critical technologies such as uh, microelectronics, life sciences, aviation, mobility, alternative energy, and so on and so forth. And those will present great opportunity for, I hope, not for investors like ourselves. But let's not forget, in the case of those, if there should be any break, uh, breakthrough in terms of those technologies, uh, the possibility of a China-led fourth industrial revolution may yet be possible. We'll have to wait and see.